Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is on First and Second Peter, entitled Feed My Sheep, First and Second Peter. And this particular lesson is lesson number seven in that series on servant leadership. That should prove to be quite interesting. It's the lesson for May 13 of 2017. And we hope that you're ready with your thinking caps on to discuss or to think about these issues with us. And we'd like to begin, as we always do, with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, once again we bow before you, recognizing your presence with us, asking you to guide us in our discussion as we talk about this very challenging dis subject. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Churches that really grow have leadership which is inspired. Inspired leadership gets its direction from God, but also provides opportunity for everyone in the congregation to exercise his or her individual spiritual gifts. That kind of leadership is extremely challenging and unfortunately rare. As we all know, most of the people who serve in various capacities in our churches are volunteers. So we want them to volunteer, we want them to take plenty of time, we want them to do everything perfectly. Is that just an obvious combination, right? And if services do not meet their idea of what should happen, members sometimes, as we, call, we say, vote with their feet and either move to another church or, or leave the church completely. Well, in Peter's day, there was an additional problem. Christians were suffering persecution. Let's just get a feel for that by reading the first 10 verses of 1 Peter 5. I, who am an elder myself, appeal to the church elders among you. I am a witness of Christ's sufferings, and I will share in the glory that will be revealed. I appeal to you to be shepherds of the flock that God gave you and to take care of it willingly, as God wants you to, and not unwillingly. Do your work not for mere pay. Now that sounds like you could be doing your work for pay, but not for mere pay. <laughs> but from a real desire to serve. Do not try to rule over those who have been put in your care, but be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the glorious crown, which will never lose its brightness. In the same way, you younger people must submit to your elders. Sounds like that's not a brand new problem, huh? And all of you must put on the apron of humility to serve one another. For the scripture says, God resists the proud but shows favor to the humble. And interestingly enough, that's um, not quite what the Hebrew says, but that's the Greek translation of that verse from the Old Testament. Humble yourselves then under God's mighty hand so that he will lift you up in his own good time. Leave all your worries with him because he cares for you. But be alert, be on the watch. Your enemy, the devil, roams round like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Be firm in your faith and resist him because you know that your fellow believers and all the world are going through the same kind of sufferings. But after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who calls you to share his eternal glory in union with Christ, will himself perfect you and give you firmness, strength, and sure foundation. To him be the power forever. Amen. So there's a kind of an appeal. Um, so we see that Peter now is turning from other discussions he's had to focus specifically on the leadership what kind of leadership did we have in these early Christian churches? Was there an official way of choosing the leaders? Well, the Twelve Apostles, uh, once they got Matthias voted in, uh, would, would have been the central figures. Mm -hmm. But uh, then they needed some deacons and... and uh, there were other gifts okay, that were but added. Now, let, let's speak specifically about the churches in northern, what we would call Turkey today, northern Galatia and Bithynia and those kinds of countries. How, how did those places get elders? 
Well, they were pointed at least by the apostles going yep. around and pointing them in different places. And I'm, I really struggle when I think about that issue. I mean, think of Thessalonica, for example. Paul arrives there. He's there for, what, three or four weeks. He evangelizes as fast as he can. He speaks to the Jews first, then he speaks to Gentiles, and he has to leave town. How, in that period of time, do you train a leader? Do you say, hmm, you're a good-looking guy? <laughs> how, do you, how can you be sure that you're getting a good church leader in, in, in that short a period of time? Well, they would have received the gifts of the Spirit. So, mm -hmm. uh, if Paul had spiritual discernment, he would be able to say, you know, God is giving you the gift of leadership or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, well, that certainly would be an advantage over just not having any guidance at all, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, on the other hand, they were Hebrews mm -hmm. that he was talking to. Some That's of them. Most of them. Most of them. They had already been converted to Judaism or were Jews to begin with, which means that they had a pretty decent background. And what he had to do was not so much teach them the scripture, it was to look at them from a different perspective, mm -hmm. as he had to do himself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, but still, I mean, honestly, they were brand new Christians, as far as we know. Unless in some cases they might have, he might have found places where there were already some that had come back from being exposed to Christianity and Judaism in, in, in Judea and Jerusalem, perhaps. But there's no, we don't have any evidence for that. Um, well, we know that there were synagogues in those cities. Yeah. And they always went to the synagogues first. Yes, that's true. Look, there could have been people with leadership experience in those synagogues. And, and that's also possible, <clears throat> yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, almost from day one, the church faced challenges in dealing with its rapid growth as well as other issues and problems. And you know about those things. So let me just uh, remember how the first deacons were chosen. You remember about Stephen's speech? Um, just a couple over there. It says, in each community, this is Acts 14, 23, in each community, church they appointed elders, and with prayer and, prayers and fasting they command, commended them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. And Acts 15, 6, the apostles and the elders met together to consider this question. So obviously they, these elders became a part of the, the leadership, clearly. 1 Timothy 5, 17 says, the elders who do good work as out leaders should be considered worthy of receiving double pay. We just raised the question of whether they're going to be paid at all. Paul says they should be worthy of double pay. Three times zero is still zero. Yeah, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. Although he, here in chapter 5, he was saying not for uh, sordid gain or like, yeah. where was it uh, that they, uh, they implied that there was something to getting uh, doing yeah. that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, not well, for sort of did gain, but with eagerness. Yeah. So let's think about this for a minute. Here are a group of disciples who have been following Jesus around and basically just, I mean, basically following the leadership of Jesus. They were fishermen, they were tax collectors, they were, you know, zealots that wanted to get rid of the Romans and maybe some others that were farmers or something like that. And all of a sudden, they end up finding themselves leaders of a huge growing organization. Where did they get any training for that? Even with Jesus, I mean, how many big organizations did he lead? To give an example. Well, again, the, if you compare that to, to speaking in other languages, in tongues, uh, they didn't so they take, a, take a crash course in these other languages. They were divinely inspired to do it. So there could it could be an element of that. Yes, possibly. Um, in fact, Ellen White talks about their speech being more refined as a result of that, and so their yeah. behaviors would have been uh, too under the power of the Spirit. Do we still have that? Um, 
process going on as we, church, as we choose church elders in our day? Perhaps sometimes. Perhaps sometimes. That's a double maybe. <laughs> double negative. <laughs> double maybe. Well, it's interesting to note that two of the most successful preachers that we read about in the book of Acts were Stephen and Philip. And who were they originally? Deacons. Deacons. So, I'd like us to do something that our Bible study guide doesn't ask us to do, but I think it's important. I want us to take the, the bigger, wider, larger view approach to what was happening at that point. I want you to think about this for a moment. Imagine how the devil and his evil angels felt as they watched the Christian church grow exponentially. I'm sure that the devil, at the point when Jesus, just before Jesus was born as a baby boy, thought that he was just that close to just eliminating any followers of God. I mean, there was a maybe a scattered ones here and there that seemed to really care about God, but he thought he was within that close of, of essentially winning the great controversy. And even by the time Jesus died, I mean, he thought, okay, I got, maybe there's 120 here, I can deal with those. And bang, there's thousands. You know, I, I want you to imagine yourself for a moment in the council in heaven. I'm sorry, not in heaven, in the devil's council, wherever that is, um, as they're reporting on 3,000 who are baptized on Pentecostal Sunday. What did they say to each other? Who, the devil? Devil and his angels? Yeah. <coughs> I don't know. I kind of, I don't think he really trusts his own judgment on who he thinks he's got and who he doesn't. Things just change. They could change any time. Yeah. I mean, he'd rather just knock them off so he doesn't have to worry about them anymore. Well, sure. I mean, that, if God would let him do that, he'd love to do that. I'm sure he'd still love to do that. Yep. Ellen White says that very specifically. Well, so what happened a little while later? They, in the church at Antioch, which was growing, and why did, what happened in the church at Antioch that sort of caused it to sort of explode in its growth? Do you remember? You mean the church as a whole? Uh, the church, the specific church at Antioch. I think there were some, some people from Syria, no, from uh, Cyprus, or Libya, Libya, Cyrene, that came and, uh, Converted okay. some Gentiles. Weren't, isn't that, is that what you're referring to? Yes. If I can find the passage here. Uh, is it 11, I think? Acts 11. About that, start with verse 27. About that time, some prophets went from Jerusalem to Antioch. I'm sorry. That's not the one I'm looking at. I thought that was it. Anyway. Um, what happened here was that some people came from Cyprus verse and Cyrene. Huh? Look up to verse 20. Yeah. In what chapter? Same place. 11. 11, okay. I didn't get back. Maybe even it. before that. Actually started at 19. Oh, there it is. Some of the believers who were scattered by the persecution which took place when Stephen was killed went as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message to Jews only. Notice there's still that feeling. But other believers who were from Cyprus and Cyrene, where is Cyrene? Libya. Libya. Went to Antioch. So now we have Christian missionaries, well we have missionaries, we're not going to call them Christians yet, because we're going to read in a moment or two. Missionaries going from Libya to Syria. Think about that. <laughs> and what did they do? They went to Antioch and proclaimed the message to Gentiles also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's power was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. And that church ended up being the church that was the home church for Paul and Barnabas, and later Paul and Silas. And that was the church was it was exploding. Antioch was the third largest city in the Roman Empire in those days. And that's the church that started sending Paul and Barnabas, for example, out specifically to evangelize Gentiles. And we know what 
that what that led to. So, anyway, think of the challenges of being a church leader at that point in time. Just Let's just think of a few of those. Not only did church leaders have to guide the church members from, from house to house, probably changing the place where they met from time to time to avoid attracting attention, but also they needed to be preachers and teachers, carefully explaining the scriptures. Not only that, those elders were expected to be shepherds of their little flocks. They had to deal with the problems that would arise in mixed congregations coming from a variety of backgrounds. So what do we know about those groups that were, that were members of the early Christian church? We've already mentioned that some of them were former Jews. What else do we know? A bunch of them that were, former, that were still slaves. Some of them were Roman citizens. A lot were Gentiles. A lot were Gentiles, former Gentiles. Some of them with pretty, if we believe what Peter says here, is pretty assorted backgrounds. You know? And if you read Paul's letters, you get more details too. Mm -hmm. So, mm, yeah. So where are you going to find church leaders who are just going to solve that problem, just throw everybody into a big melting pot, and out comes a beautiful brew, right? Or maybe we should call it well, a broth. Well, if we love one another, yeah, even with the differences, part of the problem is is not so much the issues. It's do we still love one another? Can we still get along? There's a story told about one of the early disciples that apparently learned from Paul or possibly from John, who was who was the head of the church at Smyrna for years. And he lived through two or three persecutions and so forth, and the church managed to survive without being, you know, challenged. And then one Sabbath day, they came to a, apparently this was a farmhouse that was out a little ways outside the city center, and they caught him, along with others, other Christians that were there. And this man... He knew what the, what was what was what they were going. They obviously they were there intentionally to arrest him and kill him. And he said to the lady of the house, he said, "Please feed, pre prepare some food for these people and feed them." And he stood in the corner. Of the, this is documented. He stood in the corner of a, of the room while they're eating, and prayed for every Christian that he knew about in the whole area. While they're eating, and then they're getting ready to escort him out and, and kill him. So that tells us a little bit about what kind of people they were in those days. Well, Peter calls himself an elder. He reminded the elders that they needed to un un understand as far as possible the full meaning of the mission of Jesus to this earth and how it fulfilled the prophecies of the Old Testament. Now why was that really important? Why did they want to talk about how the mission of Jesus, the life of Jesus, fulfills the mission of the Old, Te the prophecies of the Old Testament? That was their message to the to the Jews, especially to the Jews. Right? They they wanted to say, "Look, here is your scripture. This is look what it says here, and here is the fulfillment in this Jesus." It's a compelling that's, argument. That's what the Bereans did. They yeah. searched the scriptures to see if these things were so. And he told them, "Look." If you're a part of this, you can one day, one day share in the glory that Christ was, would come back to reveal. Peter reminded the elders that caring for a local church congregation was a lot like attending a flock of sheep. Now, I don't think any of us have ever been shepherds at any, any significant period of time, but we know, we read about shepherds. I, we used to love, when I was young, we would travel up into the high country and in Idaho and, and sometimes in, in Montana or, or Wyoming and so forth like this to visit some of the national parks and so forth and often in those areas because it was huge huge open areas there would be enormous flocks of sheep and sometimes you just have to stop and wait for them to get off the road so you could drive through and I mean but we all know somewhat you know something about the sheep and what how they behave what do you have to do with sheep they're about as clueless as it yes. comes. 
So these people that we used to see always would have three, two or three dogs, and those dogs were always and any time a sheep would try to wander away a little bit, and those dogs were trained, they knew how to get those sheep back in line, boy. So, that, so these elders of the churches now didn't have any dogs, so they had to, they, what part of their responsibility was someone gets out of line or starts doing crazy things, you got to sort of reel them back in, right? Well, in our day, do we, do we see groups that are heading off in various directions? And if so, how do we respond? Depends on which group you're in. <laughs> I see. If, it, if you're in the group, then you think everything's fine because you're yeah. ethnocentric. Yeah. Because your group is always right. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not uh, just groups, it's also individuals. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, we are all a little bit in disagreement. Mm -hmm. We see it quite often. Well, I mean, and where do you draw the line between someone who's a careful student and really is trying to figure out exactly where they need to be, what the truth is, and maybe has come up with some new ideas as opposed to someone who's just wants to be different? To the law and to the testimony. Yeah. And what but, spirit they are of? Are they mm -hmm. walking in love or are they... Yeah. Just uh, trying to build up their kingdom. Yeah. Well, it turns out that uh, these kind of bizarre ideas were not new in the, in, in, in the New Testament. Look what Jeremiah said, Jeremiah 10, 21. I answered, our leaders are stupid. They do not ask the Lord for guidance. That This is why they have failed and our people have been scattered. It's pretty clear what he thought about the leaders, huh? Look at his... Our leaders today aren't like that. Uh, I didn't comment about that at all. And Ezekiel said, as surely as I am the living God, you had better listen to me. My sheep have been attacked by wild animals that killed and ate them because there was, there was no shepherd. My shepherds did not try to find the sheep. They were taking care of themselves and not the sheep. So listen to me, you shepherds. I, the sovereign Lord, declare that I am your enemy. I will take my sheep away from you and never again let you be their shepherds. Never again will I let you take care of only, your, take care only of yourselves. I will rescue my sheep from you and not let you eat them. Wow. Again, it's a good thing our leaders today aren't like that. Yeah. Zechariah 11, verse 17. That worthless shepherd is doomed. So we have stupid shepherds, and now we have worthless shepherds, and we have shepherds that are trying to eat the sheep. He has abandoned his flock. War will totally destroy his power. His arm will wither, and his right eye will go blind. Wow. That's pretty... Potent stuff, huh? Well, they're blind to the truth mm -hmm. more than anything else. It's not just physical black blindness. And you know that I'm going to always try to come back and ask, well, what about us today? How many of our Adventist churches today are being led or instructed and carefully prepared for what's the big event ahead of us? Second coming. The second coming, the final events of this world's, world's history. Do you see in the Adventist church around us, in the churches around us, people who are being carefully trained and prepared for the second coming? There are always a remnant, no matter what. God always has a remnant. So there, there are, if you look for it, you know, you might condemn this institution or that particular mm -hmm. local church, but within that, particularly if it's a large group, you'll, you can find those who are seeking after God as well as in, those who are not. In the first 13 verses of Matthew 25, it talks about some young women who went out for a wedding. And how many of them were sleeping? All of them. But some had the oil. Half of them. Half of them had the oil. And we wonder... Some, they all had oil. Some of them had extra oil. Had for enough the oil. Enough yeah. oil for the needs, yeah. Well, um, what does that oil represent? Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, yeah. we're told. And so we had contact with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Well, the wise 
the wise ones were the ones who were saved. What the foolish ones lacked was wisdom. Mm -hmm. And wisdom and Holy Spirit should be considered the same thing. Mm -hmm because there's no true Holy Spirit without true wisdom and good, sound well, logic. Surely the Holy Spirit would lead us to, into wisdom. That's, that should be, I mean, if he's, if, if he's guiding us as he guided the early church, that would be wonderful, wouldn't it? Well, they all had oil at one point, mm -hmm. so something stopped them and others kept going. Well, now let's go back to our disciples again and just talk about them a little bit more. Near the end of Jesus' ministry, the mother of John, James and John, brought her two sons. And there's pretty good evidence that they were cousins of Jesus. There's, there's, there's not, not perfect evidence, but pretty good evidence that they were cousins of Jesus. And she brought them and she says, Promise me that you will let my two sons one sit on your right and one sit on your left when you come into your kingdom. Now, of course, what was she expecting? But of course, Aunt. <laughs> she was expecting that, and she was expecting that Jesus was about to set up his kingdom, his earthly kingdom in Jerusalem, right? Nepotism. And they think they were probably related because who would ask for such a thing just out of the blue? Well, no, that's not the reason. The reason they, the argument is, I don't have to go through the time to go through the details right now, but if you look at the women who are standing at the cross, and one place it, it names someone, and it, and, 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 and it names two ladies, and then someone who's the mother of James and John, and another place it names three women, who, and the third one is one that that is, you know, Possibly that, and the sister, it says the sister of Mary. And so you, you have to sort of put those two passages together. Well, that's, that's for the, um, the possibility of being related. Yeah. But I just, I just wonder why somebody would, some mother would take their sons up and ask for such a thing when there's probably other mothers all over the place. That exactly. Would, Every mother would like to ask for that position, sure. And that's why the other disciples were so upset when they thought that James and John were getting an advantage. Well, what did Jesus say to them? Don't know what you're asking, <laughs> basically. Well, not for, for me to give, it's for my Heavenly Father. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and now the tough question. How many of our church leaders today are really willing to be servant leaders, to be humbly serving their churches. And real leaders, I guess we should ask too. Uh, some might be very humble and not be very good leaders. I mean, these are, these are I mean, they're, quest they're really almost unanswerable questions. I realize that. Um, and in, in some sense, uh, being a critic is the easiest job in a world yeah. of sin because there's always something to criticize about somebody. Yeah. So uh, there, there's a sense in which we should be lifting our leaders up. Uh, but from an introspective uh, standpoint, leaders should be thinking these things. You know, what about me? Am I walking mm -hmm. in the faith? Am I walking in love? And certainly... It's obviously true that God is, doesn't want us to choose leaders so they can sort of be Lord over the congregation. Um, Ellen White comments about that. She says, Jesus bears tenderly with them, not rebuking their selfishness and seeking preference above their brethren. He reads their hearts. He knows the depth of their attachment to him. The love is not a mere human affection, though defiled by the earthliness of its human channel. It is an outflowing from the fountain of his own redeeming love. He will not rebuke, but deepen and purify. Desire of Ages 548, paragraph 6. Well, when you talk about leaders, what, what quality is a leader in that kind of a situation? Is it just that they're, they're wise? A lot of people are wise, and they're well, not really that great of leaders. Yeah. Okay, we've already talked about, let's just review, 
they in, in Paul and Peter's day they needed to be they needed to try to physically protect their their flocks from persecution like probably moving from house to house from time to time where they met there were no there were no churches per se they were supposed to preach to them they were supposed to teach them they were supposed to guide them instruct them in the scriptures they were supposed to be humble and teach them they were supposed to be an example in their own lives i mean how much more do you want well there's some people that are more extroverted than others some people sure. are introverted so um, there might be a talent to actually being leaders that yeah that um, would it, would a Christian leader be different than a secular leader? Or would a secular leader make a good Christian leader? Well, if you study those things, there are different styles of leadership, mm -hmm. autocratic and <laughs> so forth, and, and democratic in various ways. So uh, um, some of those could be applied uh, to... Uh, to Christianity, but really it, it comes down to, to love and seeking to build. Mm -hmm. Love seeks to build things up, and uh, knowledge in and of itself uh, just puffs us up, makes us appear yeah. appear big, but we're empty. <laughs> yeah. Um, how many Christian leaders today, even thinking outside of the Adventist church, would be willing to die for their congregations? That's good. that's the kind of stuff Peter was talking about. Well, how do you how do you decide to do that? You got to kind of wait until the opportunity happens yeah. before you actually make that decision. Well, there'd probably be a lot of people who say, "Man, I don't think I w I would have never known I would have done that." Yeah. When you go that's to to heaven, um, you just I mean, you can't bone yourself up for something like yeah. that. You are, you got to be in the situation to make it happen. I mean, to watch it happen to see mm -hmm. what it'll... But we, we all know yeah. that surrender and self-denial have never been popular uh, ideals. Uh, Certainly humility is not yeah. in the secular world. Yeah, when, when Moses called himself, under the instruction of God, the meekest man who ever lived... Uh, he wasn't boasting. <laughs> that was not something to be proud of in his day. But look at these words about Jesus himself, Philippians 2, starting with verse 4. And look out for one another's interest, not just for your own. The attitude you should have is the one that Christ Jesus had. He always had the nature of God, but he did not think that by force he should try to remain equal with God. Instead of this, of his own free will, he gave up all he had and took the nature of a serpent, a serpent, not serpent, a servant. He became like a human being and appeared in human likeness. He was humble and walked the path of obedience all the way to death, his death on the cross. Boy, where do you, how do you measure up to a standard like that? I mean, and, 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 and that verse hints at this idea, you know, Jesus came down from a perfect environment, remember, where he was revered and looked up to and respected for his leadership, etc., and chose to become a helpless baby boy, totally dependent upon his, his mother and others that were around him, uh, living a challenging life, constantly accosted by the devil, and finally dying the death of a common criminal. How could he do it? What, what do you suppose would have happened if... Love. Uh, yeah. That's the, uh, the answer, <coughs> how we could have done it. He showed us how to love our enemies, mm -hmm. basically. Yeah. What if he had set up, sent a message, instead of coming down like that, just sent a message down and say, I will come and do all this for you if you'll pay me what it's worth. Isn't that what people say today? You want, want me to do the new job? Well, he might have been getting paid. It's just the type of money that he wants <laughs> okay. is different than the, what you're saying there. Yeah. For the joy set before him, he endured yeah. the cross. So there was, there was something in it for him, but it wasn't something that we could muscle up and pay. Well, in the days of Peter and Paul, society was very stratified. And we don't, don't have time to go into all the details, but 
Roman citizens and people of that sort and, 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 and pol political leaders were way up here and then at the bottom were slaves, basically, in their society. And the word translated humility that Peter's talking about was a Greek word which means lowly, insignificant, weak, poor. Such people had no status in society in those days. <coughs> well, Peter, in instructing the elders, um, he also talked to the young people and he said, you must submit and respect your elders. That would obviously be an ideal situation, but I'm sure it was never easy. When Peter said that he wanted us to put on humility, he used the word tapenofrosune, tapenofrosune, which means low-minded, base, which is from the tapenos, lowly or humble, humility, lowliness of mind, the esteeming of, uh, the, the esteeming of ourselves small inasmuch as we are so, the correct estimate of ourselves. And that's uh, from the Complete Word Study Dictionary of the New Testament. Um, so he's saying we need to, we need to have a, a correct evaluation, a real correct evaluation of ourselves. So <clears throat> God said way back in Proverbs three thirty four, and this is the Greek version of that: God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Now, here's a situation he's trying to bring the proud down and he's trying to bring the humble up. How do you do both those things at the same time? Self-fulfilling. Okay. The prouds always end up hurting themselves at some point. Okay. So, clearly, Peter's suggesting that the, one of the prime characteristics of these church leaders he was talking about <coughs> was humility. And uh, that's not easy. Now, it's, it's, it's a much, you know, he talks about being humble before God, our Creator. Well, it's not hard to be humble before God. I mean, if, and even before people that you sort of think of as being maybe your equal or, or somewhere above you in social standing or wealth or something like that, you can be humble before those people. But what about being humble before the very worst, the people at the lowest levels of society. The guys are standing on the, out on the corner holding a cardboard box that says, please give me some money. Do you, uh, how do we relate to those kind of people? They're worth just as much in God's sight as yeah. anybody else. So the true test of whether we are really humble is how we relate to those, that kind of people, not how we relate to the people who are up there somewhere fancy people in society, so forth. It's kind of hard to do that the right way. I mean, you could, you could say, I want you to start treating these people nice, and you, mm -hmm. you may end up treating them nice, but for maybe the wrong reasons. Whereas there, the real reasons, you are genuinely doing it. Mm -hmm. So... I'm not quite sure if you tell somebody to do that, if that's really going to happen or not, even if they act it. Here's a challenge. The Seventh-day Adventist Church has always been much more successful at recruiting or evangelizing the lower classes than we have at evangelizing the higher classes. Why do you think that is? I didn't think it was that way. It says it's strictly it true is. that what these mm -hmm. days. What? Is that true these days? Yeah, still is. Well, I they, thought I thought the Adventist Church um, had a little little better luck with the higher ups because we were more logical, or if the Some. theology makes sense, and you can actually talk to people about it. Yeah. Um, the, we used to, and I haven't heard anybody say this recently, but um, in, in some, a number of years ago, we, they used to talk about the Adventist church was like a chimney. We bring people in at the basement and we send them out to the roof. We, we bring them in, we improve their health, we give them a good education and so forth, and then they, 
when they think they know everything, they leave the church. Well, the, the chimney is closer to heaven, isn't it? <laughs> That's not what they were talking <laughs> Not what they were talking about. Well, the poor see their need sometimes yeah. quicker. Not always. They can yeah. have their issues, too. And uh, in our uh, local church here, you know, we have with all the and probably in all the other ones too, you have a fair amount of students who mm -hmm. come in and not all of them are Adventists and they're workers and so we have baptisms quite regularly, not just the mm -hmm. kids, but of people who yeah. who um, saw how how lives had been changed and, and wanted to belong to this, this group. Okay, I have another question for you. How would you react today and how would we feel individually if someone from our Sabbath school class or a church member had just been executed by the government for being a Christian? You're talking about this government, not going over their side. I, I, I'm, I want you to put yourself in the place where, I mean, I, we're taught, this is what Peter was writing to. Okay, that's the kind of stuff he was writing to. How would you feel if you, you came to church on Sabbath and you had to get there secretly, probably going in different ways, and somehow you all get into this house and, and they just announce that Brother so-and-so was arrested by the government and killed. And you would say, hmm. That, <clears throat> that apparently has happened in some countries. Yes. And uh, there may be a day when it happens closer to home. Well, I wonder, this is kind of hard, but um, when you're a Christian, doesn't your idea about death change? Yeah. Doesn't it, um, don't you know that you're where you're at and um, that you put yourself in the Lord's hands and even at, even when things go bad, there's, you're still well, in the heart, yeah, Lord's uh, hands. I, so we're a little, I mean. Yeah, we're a little when, different in that respect. When that, situation kind of happens, the people are a little different than they are today. Yeah. It, it's, I don't think it would make you happy, though, no. to find out that Brother So-and-So has just no. been executed. But um, you would know what the world is about. And yeah. It would make you think twice about how serious your Christianity is, I suspect. Well, here's this is why we already read this verse, but this is why he said in 1 Peter 5, verse 8, Be alert. Be on the watch, your enemy, the devil, roams around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And if you remember what John said, you remember in, in Revelation 12, 7 and 9, Then the war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, who fought back with his angels, but the dragon was defeated, and he, does, he and his angels were not allowed to stay in heaven any longer. The huge dragon was thrown out, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan that deceived the whole world. He was thrown down to earth and all his angels with him. So here we have the devil being called a lion, being called a dragon, a serpent. What kind of, what kind of images do those things call up in your mind? Danger. Yeah. Well, we must never lose sight of the fact that the great controversy is going on between our ears. Jesus Christ is leading the forces of good. The devil himself is leading the opposition. Revelation in several places, 19 verses 13 and 16, for example, tell us that Jesus is the Word of God, the King of kings, even the Lord of lords. By contrast, Satan is pictured as a dragon. Revelation 12, 7 and 9, which we just read, and, and Revelation 20 verses 7 and 8. But Revelation 12, 9 and 10 going on, Tell us what is the guaranteed end of Satan and his forces. Why would you want to join them in the second death? And despite the fact that Christians may suffer temporarily, they have a guaranteed future of eternal glory. Now, I've heard some people discuss at times about whether you'd like to follow the example of Jesus. Would you, would you like to be crucified? Would you like to really follow the example of Jesus? And some have, so, I'm, I hope tongue-in-cheek said, well, if you knew that you were going to rise on Sunday and go to heaven, does that help? Well, there still is the pain. Mm -hmm. 
So I don't know if, if like is the right term. You maybe choose what you <laughs> choose to follow. Yeah. Well, even so, when you're a Christian, you, you kind of believe that anyway, don't you? When you die, you, you will be resurrected. Yeah. And <coughs> so it, there's really no difference, so you still have that problem of getting over the hump. Well, you remember that the faith chapter uh, is, is Hebrews 11. In verses 13 and following in that chapter, it says, it was, by, it was in faith that all these persons died. They did not receive the things God had promised, but from a long way off they saw them and welcomed them and admitted openly that they were foreigners and refugees on earth. That's not completely true. Why is it not completely true? I guess I, 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 I have to rescind. It was, it was after this that he said, a little bit later, he talks about Moses. Where was Moses by this time? Heaven. In heaven. heaven. Well, he says, those... Um, so, uh, refugees, they were foreigners and refugees on earth. Those who say such things make it clear that they are looking for a country of their own. They did not keep thinking about the country they had left. If they had, they would have had the chance to return. Instead, it was a country, a better country they longed for, the heavenly country. And so God is not ashamed for them to call him their God because he has prepared a city for them. So, does that help? Yeah, I think we need to consider another matter. Okay. It's possible to be persecuted and curse your enemy and it's possible to be, because of your faith, it's also possible to be persecuted and love your enemy. Mm -hmm. There's a big difference between those two extremes. Mm -hmm. And this is where following Christ doesn't imply just dying. Mm -hmm. It implies dying with that same mindset, which was yeah. that of Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, there's probably no greater example of servant leadership than the story of Jesus with his disciples in the upper room. You know about what it says in John 13. I'm, I'm trying to imagine. I mean, here's a home that has some kind of a large gathering place. And we know, what do we know about that home? Who did it belong to? John Mark's parents. It was John Mark's home where they were meeting. And it was an upper room in that home. And it was big enough to feed a pretty good sized crowd, just that one room. And these were obviously followers of Jesus. Where was the servant who should have washed the feet? Off for Passover. Off for Passover, I see, okay. So in a deal like that, did they just leave the, the water and the basin there and they were expecting um, one of the disciples to do the job? Maybe we don't know. know. Maybe the servant got sick. Yeah. Or maybe he was busy down cooking something in the, down below and didn't realize that they had arrived. Who knows? But today, as we, as we participate in our quarterly communion services, we are to be reminded that it was God who bowed down and washed 12 pairs of dirty feet. Try to imagine yourself in the position of one of those disciples. Your feet are down there and they're dirty because you've been walking around with open sandals in what could have been mud, but at least dust. What do you think Jesus was thinking as he washed those dirty feet? Interesting that he says, do likewise to one another. And the story doesn't tell us that any of them did it to him. No. He may have ended up, he may have sat back in his chair with still dirty feet. Well, in consenting to become man, here's a couple of some comments from Ellen White. In consenting to become man, Christ manifested a humility that is the marvel of the heavenly intelligences. The act of consenting to be a man would be no humiliation were it not for the fact that of Christ's exalted pre-existence, 
we must open our understanding to realize that Christ laid aside his royal robe, his kingly crown, his high command, and clothed his divinity with humanity that he might meet man where he was and bring to the human family moral power to become the sons and daughters of God. To redeem man, Christ became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The humanity of the Son of God is everything to us. He's talked about the divinity, now she's talking about the humanity. It is the golden chain that binds our souls to Christ and through Christ to God. This is to be our study. Christ was a real man. He gave proof of his humility in becoming a man. Yet he was God in the flesh. When we approach this subject, we would do well to heed the words spoken by Christ to Moses at the burning bush, Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Exodus 3, 5. We should come to this study with the humility of a learner, with a contrite heart. And the study of the incarnation of Christ is a fruitful field which will repay the searcher who digs deep for hidden truth. That's in the Youth Instructor, October 13 of 1898, just as she was finishing up writing Desire of Ages. Those who, and elsewhere she said, those who would be his disciples, he invites to take his yoke upon them and to learn of him who is meek and lowly of heart. And he promises those who do this that they shall find rest unto their souls. The meekness and humility that characterized the life of Christ will be made manifest in the life and character of those who walk even as he walked. Also from this instructor, November 8, 1894. So in light of the words we've read from Peter here, can you look around you among your church members and see examples of the true servant leadership and humility that he spoke about? Is it obvious? Oh yeah, one there and one there and one there. Or are we not so inclined to be like that? I know I'm asking a lot of almost impossible questions here, but... I've seen some of the old hands be like that. Okay. Used to be much more common than I see today. Mm -hmm. So what are the qualities of a good Christian leader? I'll, leave, I'll, I'll let you think about that. Yeah, go ahead. Well, they need to be full of God's love and His compassion. Feed my sheep, which is the title of the, this grouping but goes back to John 20 is it yeah where Jesus said yeah. feed my sheep so yeah. they need to feed the sheep they need to build us up in love with one another um, yeah well there are those who claim let's look at one of the other problems that our modern church leaders have to deal with there are those who claim that Satan is not a real being just an evil influence either from within ourselves or in the world in general. How would you answer someone with that kind of a claim? Obviously, it, it would wreak havoc with our ideas of a great controversy. Well, no evil in the human nature of Jesus could possibly have been responsible for the temptations of Jesus in the wilderness. Think about that. How could evil in our human natures cause 2,000 pigs to run down a cliff and drown in the Sea of Galilee? I think if you take the Bible serious, those, those would be a couple of questions that would be appropriate to ask. For those Christians who believe in the great controversy over the character and government of God, it is important to understand some of Satan's methods. So let's look at a couple of them in our last couple of minutes. But his most successful scheme, this is Ellen White again, but his most successful scheme, that's the devil's scheme, and deceiving man has been to conceal his real purposes and his true character by representing himself as man's friend and a benefactor of the race. He flatters men with the pleasing fable that there is no rebellious foe, no deadly enemy that they needed to guard against, and that the existence of a personal devil is all a fiction. While he thus hides his existence, he is gathering thousands under his control. He is deceiving them as he tried to deceive Christ, that he is an angel from heaven doing a good work for humanity. And the masses are so blinded by sin that they cannot discern the devices of Satan. 
and they honor him as they would a heavenly angel while he is working their <coughs> eternal ruin. Review and Herald, July 28, 1874. And elsewhere she said, one class have a theory that there is no personal devil and that Christ had no existence before he came to this earth. And they try to maintain these absurd theories by wresting scriptures from their true meaning. The utter folly of human wisdom in matters of religious faith is thus made manifest. The heart that is not sanctified and imbued with the Spirit of Christ is perverse in its interpretation of the inspired word, turning the truth of God into senseless falsehood. And some who have not searched the scriptures with humble hearts allow these wild speculations to unsettle their faith. They accept them in the place of the plainly revealed will of God. And again, <coughs> Signs of the Times, March 27, 1884. Well, I want to get, make sure we get to the end down here. Peter talks about elders and overseers and shepherds. Elders, uh, overseers are, are pretty much similar to shepherds. There, Think about the shepherd. Another word for shepherd is pastor. Jesus is called a shepherd several places. He's called the chief shepherd in 1 Peter 5, 4. He's called the good shepherd in John 10. Uh, why is pride regarded as such an evil thing in the Bible? Why is pride a very bad thing for church leaders? Even church leaders' wives are supposed to be tested, Peter says. So we must not forget that we live in the devil's domain. God has promised his loving care for us, but the evil lion is also lurking. We need to remain alert and awake. Peter reminds his readers that they were and are not standing alone. Others were or are going through the same kinds of troubles that they were going through. And what about us? Think about the changes that have taken place in the structure of the church down from the times of the apostles to our day. They start out with that group of disciples and then there were the deacons. And look at our church organization today. Some people are even calling for a reorganization of our church. Our church has a representative system of church organization. Do we understand how the church works? How the, we as members are responsible for choosing our leaders? Are any of those leaders think of themselves as hierarchical with the, their being up here and they're just giving authority down? What kind of a church do we have? What kind of a church should we have? What kind of a church do you have? Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for these words of wisdom from your friend Peter. You know the challenges that he, uh, he had himself from the time of his youth until he became your faithful follower. Help us to learn from him through these lessons is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.